Welcome to Crank of Commentaries. As always, I am your host, Jake Del Mastro, and I'm joined by my very good friend and co-host, Keaton Byer. Hello, Keaton. Hello, how's it going? You know, not too bad. Do you, do you, uh, are you ready for this? I am. Can you handle this? I think I can handle it. Because, you know, I think we're pretty good at handling things, you know? You know, much like the TSA, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we handle have, shit. Yeah, we handle shit on this podcast. <laughs> yeah, that's a yeah. that's a much better opening bit than the bit I was going to do. I was going to do the, uh, I was going to say, uh, I would have voted for Obama a third time. But uh, that's, my yours is much better. Thank you. So, as you may have guessed from our cryptic references. Oh, so cryptic. <laughs> Masters of weaving webs of deception, we are. Yes, the the uh, the movie that we're covering today is uh, the 2017 horror film Get Out. Get Out. Yeah, and you know it's a good film. I like it. We're gonna spoil the hell out of it. A very. Uh, I mean, we spoil every movie we've ever done, and I think that kind of, kind of goes without saying. But yeah. as you just mentioned, this this if you're a first time listener. Uh, this is a big spoilie. If you're a long time listener and you and you don't care or you haven't watched it, go f- watch it because, as you said, it's 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 good to not have spoil for you. Yeah, no, like I I really enjoyed uh, watching this movie without really knowing that much about what's happening in it. So uh, and then know. it's fascinating to go back and watch it a second time. Like, yeah, definitely. No, how it, what happens. Um, because yeah. then you can see there's a lot of stuff to look out for in that that rewatch. But um, yeah. So, but before we actually get into spoiling the movie, which we will do, yes, um, we have some uh, administ- administrative um, stuff yeah, to so, uh, uh, yes. get through yes. here. Yes. Um. So, I have noticed that uh, you know over the last couple, uh, last little while over the podcast. Uh, for some reason, people aren't listening to the part twos as much as the uh, part ones. So, uh, you know, it, it might be kind of confusing the way we're posting this. Because uh, I guess if, you, if you're, if you like, looking on your timeline or whatever, and you see, oh, we posted a new episode, but, oh, it's on the same movie. That might be yeah. confusing. Uh, but, yeah, there are, in fact, two, Usually two, two parts, parts to every film we do. Three. Usually. Sometimes it's three. Uh, and occasionally, occasionally it's, it's one. one. Yes. Um, but yeah, every week or almost every week, there should be a new episode unless we're taking that week off, which we will tell you ahead of time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. New episode every week, two parts. Usually we do, uh, similar organizational things, but we're going to start outlining the parts for you so you know when to expect what. So if, you know, if there's something that's just in part one that you care about or something just in part two, you can do that too. So you can just listen to this first little bit, and we'll we'll lay them out for you. Exactly. So without further ado, so, so this yeah, is part this one. Is, we are in part <laughs> one. This is the uh, in part one. We're gonna do the uh, we're gonna do the summary. We're gonna do some initial thoughts. Uh, for a change of pace, we're gonna do how did they shoot it? Um, because that's always fun, and we thought we'd move that into part one to shake things up a little bit. Um, and maybe catch some catch some interest <laughs> in part one that isn't always there. Um, and then we're gonna do the music, and then we might do another segment after that. That is always yeah, there. Yeah, I mean, long time listeners will probably guess what. Yes, it is, exactly. <laughs> and then next week we return uh, in part two uh, for some talking about the production, which will include the pre-production period. Um, and then we're going to talk about, because this movie is a weird movie with, like, in terms of how it how it uh, uh, was received and then the award season that came afterwards. There's yeah, so so we'll talk all about that. Uh, yeah, that, there's a which, lot to parse Which is really interesting, so uh, part two should be really good. Yeah, and then we'll we have about that. another mysterious segment. Yeah, another segment. Which, uh, you know, long-time listeners will probably also know what that is. Yeah, so that's all part two, so... So that will be next week. So, yes. so without further ado, as you said, so there was us, in fact further ado. 
when I there was further ado. Well, yeah. I thought you meant into this explanation of the outline for part one, but there, <laughs> this is that. Well, that now I've created more ado. You're so just <laughs> lots of ado here. We so let's just jump into this. Cut summary. down on the ado. Yeah, yeah. No more ado. <laughs> Um, so do you want to summarize mean. this? You want to summarize this movie for us? You know I could, but you know I feel like I've been doing the summaries a lot. So why don't we give you a chance, Keaton? <laughs> okay. All right, here we go. So okay, spoilers starting right now. Oh, mega spoilers! Yeah, I'm gonna be so, super spoiler. If you don't want this movie spoiled, go watch the movie. Go watch the movie. Yeah. Then the, from here on out, there will be spoilers. So you can't just skip ahead. There's no. spoilers. Many spoilers. I don't know why you're still listening, yeah. to be honest. Leave. <laughs> Go. Okay. Um, but come back. Well, come yeah, back. Later. Come back after um, you watch it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so there's a guy, uh, and his name is something. <laughs> something Washington. The main Which character. Guy? Chris? Oh, uh, even. Chris. Is his name Chris? To be honest, he's such a boring character. <laughs> Yeah, he's he's he, he is a boring character. Uh, but you know, Chris, that's it's Chris. Kind of the point. It's Chris, it's Chris Washington. Right. So you've got you've got Chris Washington, um, and he's he's with his girlfriend, whose name is Rose Armitage. Rose. And they're gonna be going out to uh 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 her family's house in in the country uh for a weekend yeah in, in, in upstate, upstate new, new york. york yeah and they're in new york he's a new yorker through and through i believe he was born and raised is the implication he's a sick boy he says a couple of times right um so they're going to her parents house in the country and uh he he's a bit concerned that she has not alerted her family to the fact that he is a black man because he's concerned that they're going to be weird about it. Um, but she says, don't be concerned. My parents aren't racist. My dad yeah, would have voted for Obama They would have voted time. for Obama a third time if they could have. <laughs> so clearly not racist. Um, yeah. That... that line is one of the funniest jokes in this entire movie. Are there, yeah, there's is, some great... Could, they could have voted for some, Obama the third, third time. time. <laughs> yeah, there's some great... Greatest greatest president of my lifetime. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I, I screamed at, yeah. My, at my TV. It, no, it was Jimmy Carter. It was Jimmy Carter. Oh, well, obviously. It was Jimmy obviously. Carter, yeah. The one... You know, it was a short time, but it was a great yeah, time. Yeah, and I assumed that he was he was old enough to be alive for Jimmy Carter's presidency. I, I'm not 100% sure, but That's I true. assumed. Um, anyway, so they they drive up to the cottage in a very uh, uh, kind of shining-like intro. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And he calls his friend, the, uh, the TSA agent, who we... Rod, Rod Williams... Williams. Um, who's a great character, um, very, very fun comedian, um, plays him. And so he calls him, tells him where he's going. He says some funny shit about the TSA because he's part of the TSA. And that comes up many times. Yep. So anyway, they, 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 they get to the house and they get in, he gets introduced to the family who is, uh, you know, uh, 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 an upper class, uh, a white family who is, I don't know, uh, uh, acts exactly how you expect them to act. And her father uh, quickly informs him that he would have voted for Obama a third time. Just if she's, he could. if he could have, if he could have, and she immediately brings up a story about his his father, uh, losing a race to uh uh, what's his name? Jesse Owens. Yeah, so he loses a race. His grandfather lost a race to Jesse Owens, and apparently never got over it. Uh, so now they're in the house, and then they find out. Okay, they find out that there's actually going to be a party this weekend. Oh no! So it's going to be much worse than just hanging out with the family because there there there's this this big function yeah where all these other also her brother comes over and is super weird oh yeah her brother's really weird he tries to like choke him out in like a weird way <laughs> yeah tries to pull some mma moves yeah yeah him. his brother's really weird 
jujitsu and shit. Yeah. So so um, very weird. From his nervous tics, they can tell that Chris is a is a a smoker who's trying to quit. So they offer to give him some hypnotism. Well, the the Catherine Keener <laughs> character offers to give him some hypnotism to to fix that because she's a a, a, a a psychotherapist or whatever who who has developed a special uh, hypnotic method for treating smokers. Um, but he declines yeah. uh, because that's weird as fuck. Um, and he's met her. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, but anyway, so he, late at night that night, he sneaks out for a smoke. He ha- He's having a smoke and he sees a guy running it's a creepy ass scene he sees a guy just like running in the dark yeah. and the guy like runs right at him and like runs into his face and then runs away and that's mysterious so it freaks him out so he goes back yeah. in he gets intercepted by Catherine keener who's like i know you were having a smoke let me hypnotize you yeah so but but back to the groundskeeper guy like importantly it's uh there's some very weird characters hanging around yeah the there's house. the there's the the quote unquote help Who's hanging around? Um, yeah. Only black folks he encounters in the house, and they're yeah, conspicuously acting very strange. So finally, he's intercepted by Catherine Keener, <laughs> who hypnotizes him. Yep. Um, well, yeah, she hypnotizes him in a really weird way. Uh, he falls into a place that she refers to as the sunken place, and then he like wakes up and thinks it's like all a dream. But then finds out that it wasn't a dream. He actually got hypnotized. Yeah, because he can't. Because he, he can't yeah, because he anymore. hates cigarettes. So he's like, I think your mom hypnotized me. Yeah, it's like that's fucked up. Yeah. Um. But anyway, they have the party, and it's really weird ass party because everyone's like talking to him. Like I think he he calls he calls uh, Rod or whatever the TSA agent, and he's like, these people are clearly acting like they've never seen a a a, a black man who doesn't work for them. Yeah. And then Rod immediately jumps to sex slave. Yeah, he's like, oh, shit. they're going to fucking turn you into a sex slave, man. Like, But it is weird because, like, they are yeah. watching him. Like, they're all, like, staring at yeah. him. And they're all, Very like, you know, kind way. of appraising him in a way. It's strange. Um, yeah. And then he sees another uh, another black guy. And he's like, oh, thank God. Like, can relate to this guy being, like, the only black man around. Yeah. Um, he must kind of vaguely understand. So he goes up to this guy. But then this guy is like, yeah. not. This guy is actually the same guy from the first. Yeah, scene yeah, of the we've movie seen around. this guy earlier. We saw this guy get kidnapped when yeah. the movie started. Yeah. So this guy's being really weird. Um, and he, yeah. he's like, not on the level. Like he's not relating at all to Chris, even though Chris is like throwing out all these like you know like uh, uh, ways to relate to him he's trying to be like you know what's up and then even at the end of the conversation he tries to like fist yeah. bump him and the guy like shakes his yeah and then he like yeah really weird. Really weird. And, like, <laughs> and the way he cares it's just really creepy interaction so and then finally Chris is like this guy's really weird I'm gonna take a picture of this guy and send a picture of it to, to, to Rod my best friend yeah but well actually you missed the part where he ste- where oh he yeah Steven that's Root. right so he well, yeah. What, so guy. you tell him about Stephen Root. Okay, so Stephen Root, you know, best known maybe for playing Milton in Office Space. Yeah, or uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Bill Dotrieve on King of the Hill, the greatest animated yeah, TV um, show besides Scooby Doo of all time. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'll just uh, leave that there. Uh, <laughs> um, so anyway, yeah. So also he he has this conversation with this blind guy. Who 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 knows him? Because you know this guy is a uh, an art Steven dealer. Root is yeah the blind guy, yeah. Um, and he knows uh Chris because Chris is a photographer, and you know somehow despite being blind, he's like you have a really good yeah, eye. Yeah, he like he knows <laughs> that he's a good a... photographer now. So. Yeah, yeah, which is a very strange thing to say. It is a very strange <laughs> thing to say. But yeah, I mean, um. At least this guy is weird, but he's like, at least he actually like talks to Chris. Yeah, he talks like, to Chris like a normal person. He's like, he's yeah, the, he's the old first person to vaguely humanize him. Exactly. Yeah. Um. So yeah, he meets him, 
and has a weird conversation with him about his eye and blind art dealing. And then he goes and yeah. he decides he's going to take a picture of uh, 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 this other uh, guy, the only other black guy around. Um, right, yeah, yeah. Uh, what's the, what are they calling him? Do you remember? I can't. I can't remember anyway, what so him. he tries to sneak a picture of him. Yeah, but like a fucking like a dumbass, dumbass. You know, he forgets to he turn forgets. the flash off. What yeah, kind of photographer exactly. Is he? He's a well, he because he's using his phone. You know, he's used to using his uh, his uh, DSLR right, yeah, 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 yeah. Canon with yeah, his exactly. long ass fucking lens. So yeah, he but yeah, so he snaps a photo of him with the f- with the flash on, and the flash sets off this guy whose nose starts to bleed and he freaks out and runs yeah. at Chris and starts screaming at him to get out get out so it's yeah. it's the title like of the film like the name of the movie um <laughs> so that's intriguing yeah so they drag him away they drag the guy who's freaking out away from Chris and then like uh the father explains that it was a seizure um, but the because whole the father is conveniently a neurosurgeon. He's a neurosurgeon. Like, yeah, yeah. Which might come up later. <laughs> might come up later. Um, <laughs> so he's like, "Don't worry, it was a seizure. Uh, you should go home and get some rest." So the other guy leaves. But Chris is like, "This is fucked. I'm, you know, I'm out. This is not. Yeah. This is freaking me out. I'm going home." And Rose is like, "I'm down. I'm with you. You know, I'm sorry. This is so bad. Let's go." So yeah. as they're getting ready to go, he sends the Rod a, the picture of the guy, right? Yeah. And Rod is like, hey, that's this other guy who's been missing forever. For six you know, months or whatever. For six months, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's definitely this other guy. Yeah. So, like, but, he doesn't dress like that. He doesn't sound like that. Yeah, you like know, this something's is... Something's up, man. Some, something's up. So just as this information comes to light, just as the shit comes to light, fucking his phone dies. Right. And he's like, so now Chris is freaking the hell out. And he's like, we got to get the fuck out of here. Yeah, let's get out. And then he, so he's like packing up his shit. And then he opens up the closet and he finds oh. a shoebox. And he's like, what's in here? So he starts going through here, there. And there's like a bunch of photos of his girlfriend, Rose, who up until this point has been like the only like yeah. redeemable character uh, uh, around yeah. him. Who's like been on his side, basically. Oh yeah, and earlier on he she had mentioned this is important. She had mentioned that he was her first black boyfriend, like the first time she'd ever dated a black man. Um yes. which is why he was so nervous about her parents' reaction yeah. in the first place. Um so then he's going through the shoebox and he, he starts flipping through photos and he's like, Holy shit, this is a bunch of photos of Rose with a bunch of black men. Like they're dating and they're like selfies. And it's like she's lied to me. Like, who are all yeah. these people? And then the last guy i believe i might be mistaken because i'm bad with faces but the last picture is the guy who was the groundskeeper who was being yeah. really weird walt or whatever walt yeah so yeah. he's like oh, okay this is she's fucked this is fucked this is all fucked i need to go so there's a whole he's trying to leave and there's a whole confrontation um in the front where she finally flips on him and is like no nah, you're not you're not going oh, anywhere. She, yeah, she's like, you know, I can't find the keys. I can't find the keys. But then we find out she's fucking a liar. She's a liar. She has the keys the whole time. <laughs> yeah. And she's like, she's in on it. Yeah. So, and then how do they knock him out? She uses Catherine Keener's, uh, uses the, the tea. Oh, the teacup. Yeah, because this she, is this is the, the whatchamacallit. What the do you hip, call that? Hip. Oh, the hypnotic uh, 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 trigger. It's uh, what do you? Yeah, there's a word for it because they literally said it in this movie. Whatever, doesn't matter. It's a hypnotic yeah. trigger. Uh, but has Rod already been? So yeah. like, well, yeah. So when she taps the 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 the, the teacup, he passes out. Um, so they do that, yeah. and he wakes up, and he's in a creepy ass basement, like rec room, um, with a ping pong table and a foosball. Yeah. Meanwhile. Oh yeah. So meanwhile. Okay, so meanwhile, Rod has been, you know, found this new, the new shit has come to light, you know, with this. Yeah, thing. Rod is freaked out. Yeah, so Rod is like, oh shit, uh, what the fuck has happened to my friend? He's not, he's not answering his phone. He's been gone for two days. Uh, they were supposed to come back, yeah, exactly, two days ago. So he goes to the police, and he's like, I have new information. Uh, this guy, my friend is missing, uh... Because he's been kidnapped by a bunch of old yeah, white people. Yeah, they're gonna people. make him into a sex slave. 
and they're going to turn him into a sex slave. I mean, it's not um, as silly as that. It actually is a bit more reasonable when you watch the scene, but yeah, that's ba- that is what happens. Well, but I mean, like that the way that's how the cops react when when yeah, he says they laugh that. at him. They laugh him out of the out of the station. So the cops the the cops laugh laugh him out of the station. Um, even after he he shows that. Uh, the other guy who's been missing for six months was there. Yeah, that that's the kind of the, in this movie that's probably the biggest like suspension suspension of disbelief moment, where it's like he does kind of have evidence of like a guy who's been missing has like popped up. You think they yeah. probably take him seriously at that? Like I get he didn't broach the topic amazingly well, but well, actually, there's um, I think th- I think there's a very specific reason why uh, Peel wrote it that way. That's. Uh, and he, it, it has to do with uh, apparently this is an actual statistic that like, uh, well, uh, black people make up thirty percent of all missing people, missing persons cases, but sixteen yeah, percent yeah, of the population. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I was just about to say is like I think I think the fact that the police like didn't pay attention was part of the whole thing. Like the the relationship with the police. Yeah, is, well, that was the part, part they were trying to make. Obviously, part of the whole yeah. movie, which again we'll talk about in part two because that's yeah. all a whole thing about this movie and you know oh yeah so he 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 gets left out of the station um but he's still on the on the case you know he's not he's not done he's on the case you know because he's 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 he got detected yeah he's a tsa TSA agent um yeah he's yeah you know sometimes even more than the police officers because you know terrorists and shit (laughs) you know sometimes you know terrorists and shit um so so then uh chris comes comes uh uh, uh, he comes to in the in the basement rec room like i said with a ping pong table and a foosball table and it's all surreal and shit and the old tv yeah there's like an old school tv and a, a, a buck like uh the head of a buck on the wall with massive horns and shit um, just like the buck they almost ran over at the beginning, or they did run over at the beginning of the film. Right, And yeah. then uh, the TV starts playing, and it's this weird, surreal, creepy-ass commercial for, like, what's... It, it's not exactly clear. What did they call it? The something procedure? Or I forget. Something? Yeah, exactly uh. what they called it. It, was, it had a weird name. And the, the video features uh, Rose's grandfather, um, and he's talking about how they're... S- their secret order has been trying to like come up with this specific thing for a while but he's it, it's not exactly clear what this thing is so he's like uh, i don't know exactly what's going on coagula coagula that's what it is gross name yeah, so gross. then the tv he the the, the tv plays a a, tea, a teacup and he passes out again so then and yeah. then he wakes up later uh, and Steven Root comes on the TV, right? And Steven Root is in, like, a hospital gown, and he's pixelated and weird. And Steven Root basically explains the whole film to us. <laughs> yeah, so basically, uh, he's like, so we're going to take part of my brain, and it's going to be put into your we're brain. Gonna jam it into your head. <laughs> and, you know, so, you know, you're going to kind of still be in there a little bit, like, you know, but, you know, I'm going to be in control. Yeah. I'm going to take over your body, basically. Uh, so it's it's kind of like the Guavuld in Stargate, Stargate actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of similarities. <laughs> um, but, yeah, uh, so you're just going to be kind of sitting there seeing everything that's happening, but I'm going to be in control. Yeah, you'll be in the sunken place. You're, you'll that... be in the sunken place, which is the thing they showed earlier. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, but we're going to cut your head open and we're going to put my brain inside your brain and it's going to be like a big brain thing. Yeah, so it becomes clear that like that other guy had that happen to him. Yeah. <laughs> that that's that's what's been ha- that's why all the like all the people were acting really weird. Yeah, yeah, they've been so they're like why he's like does he ask like why is it like why black people at the point? Yeah, no, no, no. Actually, I think this is also one of the really funny bits of the movie, where he's basically like, you know, why black people? And yeah. he's like, I don't, I don't really actually know. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Stephen Root is like, I don't know. This I is basically doesn't... like, why not? <laughs> why not? But I mean, he's like, I don't really care. I just want your eyes. Yeah, I just want your <laughs> eyes. Mess. So yeah. he's yeah, he's slightly um, removed. But they they seem to go after black people for a different reason. But yeah. 
like they're basically like oh you know some people you know think they're more like athletic or oh yeah yeah it's basically i think the whole point is this jesse owens thing yeah it's this like all comes back to this like weird eugenics thing of like uh and like dna uh 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 I don't think they went into that much detail, but yeah. basically I think the idea is that, you know, because he was so humiliated that he lost to Jesse Owens, he was like, you know, I need to become a black man to win or something yeah, like that. Yeah, exactly. So that's that's what's going on. Um, so in uh, 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 a genius move to avoid getting uh, knocked out again by the uh, the hypnotic trigger... Uh, cr- oh, Chris yeah. smartly stuffs his ear full of the the shredded chair bits from. I take issue with me this too. Scene. Of course, how did he move his? How did he get his hands to his ears? Well, he put his head down to his hands. <laughs> oh, did he? But they, they, don't, they don't show it. But yeah, to get it balled up, to get that much in your, I don't know. It seems. Like here, I'm sitting. It, it was a good idea, but I, I, I think they should have showed it on screen yeah. because I, otherwise I'm left kind of disbelieving. Okay, here I'm sitting in a chair very similar to the one he was. Uh, but are your hands restrained? No, they're not restrained. But I'm gonna keep them down and I'm gonna try and just like, just I'm just gonna try and do it. Like, and I mean, maybe. I don't know. Was his body restrained at all? Well, yeah, I that's. A, I don't think it was. But if his shoulders were restrained at all, then you can't do it. But <sighs> that'd be impossible. But if your shoulders, if it's just like your arm, like your wrists and your ankles that are restrained, then uh, you could absolutely. I could see it happening. Yeah. So anyway, he takes some fluff out of the chair and sticks it in his ear so he can't hear the fucking teacup. Exactly. Yeah. So he does it. And so he then he pretends he pretends to get knocked he pretends out. to get, become unconscious. So then uh, the son, the creepiest character of of the uh, of the of the uh, Armistead, whatever it was, family, Armitage family, Armitage, Armitage. Um, he comes in in a weird, in a creepy pair of scrubs, uh, and he comes to to yeah, because the procedure's already begun. Oh, in the other room, the procedure yeah, t- it's, has it's, begun. It's, they, yeah, it's getting people are getting cut up. Stephen Root's uh, brain is exposed. They show it you, to you on camera. Yeah, it's exposed. It, it, it's it's awesome. getting kind of kind of Cronenbergy in there. Yeah, it does get a little bit Cronenbergian. So then. Uh, Chris is like, no, I'm not unconscious, and he uh, beats in the son's head with a uh, a, a bocce ball or something. Pool ball. Was it po- oh bocce ball or pool ball? Okay, I guess it's a bocce ball, actually. It was a big ball. Big. I think it was a bocce ball, because they mentioned bocce ball Yeah, earlier. bocce or lawn bowling or something like that. I don't know. Just because I, also I feel like a bocce ball is heavier than a pool ball. Yeah, exactly. Ball. I feel like it would be much easier to beat his head in with a, with a bocce ball than a pool yeah. ball. Not that a pool ball is light. Like, I think oh, you, you could do, do it. it with both. But but it wouldn't be yeah, as easy. Yeah, I'm reaching for the bocce ball if I if I, if I I need to defend myself oh, with yeah. one. Oh, yeah. Um. So, yeah, he does that, and then he's like, okay. And then it, it, it cuts to the father who's cutting the skull open. And he's like, okay, where's my transplant? Like, where's uh, Jeremy with the transplant? So he goes and he looks out the hall, and he's like, what the fuck? He looks to the left, nothing. He looks to the right, nothing. He looks back to the left. And then he gets impaled with a fucking deer head. <laughs> yeah, he looks back to the left, and then fucking deer horn in the throat. Fuck yeah. He gets stabbed yeah. to death. Yeah, a lot of people are getting killed at this point. Yeah, it gets really violent. Awesome. This is the point in the movie where I was starting to think, I think he's getting arrested at the end of the movie. <laughs> that would have been such a good <laughs> ending, honestly. Like <laughs> that. Well, yeah. We'll talk about this yeah, yeah, yeah. later. But there there was yeah. multiple endings that were yeah. conceived. Yeah, so he stabs him, stabs him in the throat. He dies, knocks a candle over. Candle catches yeah. Stephen Root's bed on fire. Yeah. So Chris is escaping. He's about to get out the door, but it turns out Jeremy survived the beating. Oh, no, sorry. I missed the fight with uh, Catherine Keener. Catherine yeah, Keener? He... <laughs> Where she tries to teacup him, and then he smashes yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, he tries to teacup him, he smashes it, and then they like get into a struggle, and he ends up stabbing her to death. Oh, yeah, that's true. Because he got stabbed yeah, through the he, hand, Yeah, she like, actually, stabs him with like a letter opener which fully is through the hand. It's weird. gross. weird. Um, yeah, I don't... Yeah, yeah anyway. it's not, not a fun <laughs> one. <laughs> but, uh... And then... Uh, uh, and then he continues, yeah. gets attacked again by uh, Jeremy. Jeremy yeah, attacks him. Um, he kills Jeremy, stomps his face in, um, takes his keys. Yeah. Surprised that Jeremy's not already dead, to be honest. Yeah, they just needed earlier, him but, to come back know. for this this bit. But. 
Yeah. Uh, and then he, yeah, he gets in the car and starts to drive and then he away. Hits. He hits uh, the the maid the lady. Maid yeah, lady. yeah. Uh, but and then he's like, "Oh my god, um, I'm I know I shouldn't, yeah, but I'm gonna really go back for her." <laughs> but he goes back for her, um, which is weird yeah. that he does that. And he picks her up, puts her in the car, and as he's driving. Well, I don't know. Maybe he's yeah, thinking maybe yeah, I can yeah. save her. I mean, her it's all fair, you know? fair. Maybe I can un- un- remove, yeah, undo I the mean, brain. Yeah, he's thing. trying to save her. Yeah. Also, I I like the touch that they have here, where you can kind of yeah, see the scars, the scars on their head. Scars on their forehead, permanent scars. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So he then he uh, uh, he, she comes back to while she's sitting in the car, and she freaks out and attacks him. Yeah. The car. Car crashes. crashes. There's a big fight. Uh, oh yeah. Meanwhile, his girlfriend, or I suppose, I guess she's still his girlfriend. They didn't break up quite yet. <laughs> there, there was no, no official breakup. <laughs> they didn't still, officially break up. Still but... technically together. <laughs> but she, uh, so she's she... sitting there, fucking drinking milk and listening to the dirty dancing song. Like, yeah, fucking... she's being really creepy, looking for her next. Uh, yeah, her next stalking people on Facebook the... or whatever, looking for. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so... looking for what is she Google's uh, NCAA prospects? Oh God. <laughs> um. Anyway. Uh. I think she she hears something going on and she goes she after hears them. She a commotion. Yeah. She shoots at them. Yeah. Um. Yeah. She shoots at him and then Walt also shows up and starts fucking shooting people. I think shooting at him. Yeah, and then it's revealed that those are her grandparents, the the maid and the and Walt. Yeah. Uh, uh, are Walt her is the guy who lost to Jesse Owens. Yeah. Well, and he, which is funny because he was running earlier, so it all, you know. Yeah. You know, it all you comes know. together. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so uh, he's 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 about to get shot by Walt, and I guess also his Rose. Um, and yeah. then and then he's like, "Wait, I know a thing!" And so he pulls out his phone and he shoots a picture with the flash <laughs> on. Genius. And um, so Walt goes crazy, I guess, because his like the actual Walt has kind of taken control for a minute. Yeah, he has He has his and moment. And then he shoots Rose and then himself. Smart move, Walt. <laughs> yeah. Um, and for some reason, Rose isn't dead. Yeah, so she uh, she's not dead. So he goes to choke Rose to death because he's so angry at her. Uh, yeah, but then, then he's this like, is where we see the police siren. Yeah, he's like, you know what? No, I'm not going to choke you to death. And then, yeah, the police siren comes in, and he's like, oh, Yeah, and then he fuck. puts his hands he puts his hands up, and he's like, oh, shit, I'm about to get arrested. I'm going to get arrested for murdering and then, all these people. And then the door opens on the car, and then you realize it says airport on it. It says airport, and it's run. It's a t- TSA. Because it's a TSA car, not a cop car. It just not looks a like a cop car. car. Fuck and yeah. so it was like fake out, and the rod is like, come on, man. I saved you. You know, TSA. We mother. We. Uh, what are the TS motherfucking A. Hey, we are TS motherfucking A. We get shit done. <laughs> we handle shit. Yeah, we handle shit. <laughs> Handled. Anyway, and then that's it. Shit handled. So yeah, that's a that was a. So what are your initial thoughts? Um. Yeah. No. Like I. I thought this was a pretty good movie. Like uh, the thing. The. The biggest compliment I can give it is that. Um, like unlike a lot of horror movies, which are very very predictable, I did not see all the twists and turns coming. No, you know, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say like you know necessarily there was like a twist or anything like that. But like you know, it was a reveal. Yeah, no, but there were a lot of like little things that happened. I think like uh, there wasn't like one you know big. Oh yeah, one twist big moment. moment. Yeah, it kind of yeah. slowly evolved. It became clearer yeah. and clearer, and then they pulled the. Yeah, so, like, away. Uh, I was kind of glad that I didn't, like, uh, look that heavily into this movie. Um, didn't get anything ruined for me, so I really had no idea what was going on. Yeah, that and, was good. Uh, the first time I watched it, I had the same thing. Um, so, yeah, no, like, uh, really good movie. Keeps you guessing. Yeah, that's what I thought as well. I mean, I will say that, like, uh, I didn't notice that... I didn't realize Rose was going to be evil until I saw the shoebox. Yeah, yeah, me too. I had no that idea. That was totally out of nowhere for me. That was a huge, uh, huge fucking uh, blindside. Exactly. Really well written by Jordan Peele, who we will talk about uh, a bit more next episode, but 
who uh, directed this film, wrote and directed this film. What was I fucking going to say? God damn it. <laughs> I, I, I can't <laughs> tell you what you were going to say. <laughs> so this, this film's super uh, interesting because of its, uh, 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 its box office versus its budget. Oh yeah, no, no. This was a uh, was like five million dollars. Four point five. Four and a half. Yeah, million it was an unbelievable yeah. like uh, uh, profit success. Like so they only spent. Oh yeah, so absolutely. So the, the production company Blumhouse Productions wasn't the only production company, but there's three, uh, a few. But Blumhouse, um, I was reading, they don't make any films for less than five million dollars. <laughs> you mean for more than five million dollars? Oh yes, for sorry, for more than five million dollars. That's what the, like one of their uh, uh, like the president or whatever said about. Well, I mean, I made. think that that's a really good recipe for success. You know, <laughs> like yeah, yeah. You know, if you just make a bunch of movies and don't make them for that much money, a couple of them are gonna be good. Yeah, <laughs> and it made two hundred and fifty-five point four million, which is pretty amazing. That's a lot of money. Um, and the other thing, what was that? the other thing he was saying was that like they don't, no one makes money off the budget. You make money if the movie makes money, right? If, yeah, that, yeah, if yeah. that makes sense, like so, no one gets like paid off the budget. The budget only goes to like, like you're saying, the, movie. the the company doesn't make money off the budget because I mean, obviously, like you know, you need to pay like the fucking, you know. The first AC and the catering yeah, crew, yeah, and all those yeah, people, yeah, yeah. they make Not, money, but like the people make know. their salaries, but like yeah. there's no like profit off of the yeah, people exactly. in the yeah. involved. Yeah, I don't know. The one thing that like stood out to me that I thought was like kind of weird was like uh, the whole bit with uh, uh, Stephen Root's character talking about like his eye, which is like weird given that they spend like zero time establishing that he's a good photographer <laughs> yeah i feel like there was like <laughs> like he just kind of like walks around with a camera and i guess we're supposed to guess like oh this guy's a photographer yeah they just kind of like they don't show any of his photographs they don't even at the beginning yeah they don't show any of his photographs they don't have him like you know on the phone with like you know some client or something i don't know like yeah you know. exactly they don't do anything to establish that he's a photographer they don't do anything to establish that which is kind of weird besides but, show him know. with a camera yeah and th like they show him carrying a camera like, like is, they show that he i guess and you don't even get like yeah you get that he's a <laughs> but photo how do we know that that's just not his hobby exactly right? you get that like, he's a photo enthusiast but like we don't get that like he's a good photographer we should be like that he's like exactly. a gallery like yeah i don't know maybe that just got cut well, that's what i was like, thinking <laughs> there must have been more to it like there must have been stuff yeah. that we missed that's because, like, Stephen Root talks like he's like, oh, man, you're so good. You're so talented. Yeah, like, you're this great photographer. Like, are we supposed to take his word for that? Like, Apparently, yeah, because we don't ever see any of his yeah. photographs except for the one he... We see the well, one I mean, he took neither of, has uh, he. of uh, the guy. Yeah, but that was just one yeah, on his Yeah, we saw that one, though. <laughs> this is one where he's trying to be... He was trying to hide yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but anyway, what was I going to say? Like, I mean, I guess Stephen Root hasn't seen any of them either. No, because he's fucking blind. Yeah. Yeah, kind of interesting thing, uh, him having bad eyesight in this movie, too. <laughs> that just is like funny. An yeah, office yeah, face. yeah. Maybe he just needed the right prescription in this film, and it would have been. Maybe it's the same character. <laughs> no way. <laughs> oh, God, no. It's well, no, because not. <laughs> Stephen Root got. Um, how do you think he paid for it? After after he did that beach vacation, vacation he became an art dealer. Oh, he became an art dealer. I don't know. He doesn't have the voice though. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like you don't like you don't lose that uh, stammer like the money. Easily. Money gave him confidence. Yeah. Um. <laughs> you be twin line. <laughs> I'd like to, I'd like to I'd like to put your I'd like to put your brain inside my. Brain. Yeah, it was it was cool seeing. Uh, you know, previous brain, people featured on the podcast, as well as <laughs> Catherine Keener, uh, for brain. example. I'm going to put my brain inside your brain, and it's going to be like one big brain. <laughs> when you get to your eyes. With your eyes. <laughs> no, I want you. I'm going to put your eyes into my eyes so that I can have them. Okay, now yeah, let's um, move on. Yeah, that's sorry, that's so much fun. All right, should we just get on to how they feel it? Yeah. All right. Uh, let's talk about how they shot it. All right. Uh, let's talk about how they shot it. How did they shoot it? Uh, well, I'm gonna tell you. 
But before we get there, uh, let's just, you know, give credit where credit is due. Where it is we due. You got director of photography, Toby Oliver. Toby. And uh, we have Bobby Arnold, uh, who is first assistant camera. Bobby Arnold. Uh, New York unit. Yo- New York unit? Yes. And then we have um, Brian Udoff, who is the first assistant camera Los Angeles unit. <laughs> Los Angeles unit. And some of the Alabama reshoots. There's a bunch of different crews, I think, that worked on this movie because they shot in different locations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Troy Wagner is the first assistant camera, I guess, for the most of it, I guess? Yeah, it was, most of it was not shot. Like the New York. Most of it was uh, in Alabama, wasn't it? Yeah. Or was it. I yeah. noticed that, like, the first thing I noticed, like, from, like, the first couple of shots. Yeah. Just about how it looked is that the, like, the depth of field is super deep. Like, the focus is super deep. Like... Like, you can see a lot... I mean, definitely in the first shot. In the very first shot, you can see the whole fucking street. Yeah. But, like, the, I, I was... I kind of... Yeah. I noticed it in the first shot, and then I was just kind of, like, paying attention to it, like, for the rest of the film. Yeah. And it just kind of seemed like the whole movie was all super, like, uh, deep focus. I don't know. I mean, yeah, there's definitely some shots that are like that, but I, I definitely did notice a lot that was... uh sort of a little bit blurry. Yeah, well, I guess the close-ups and like that, sp- particularly the close-up yeah. of him uh, 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 strapped to the chair. Yeah. Or that, uh, that shot of yeah. him being hypnotized, which has become like the image of this film. The shot of him like c- crying. Oh, where he's got the two like tears. Of his... I wonder if they like, <laughs> if they had to like apply that to him. I don't know. I guess they had... Or maybe, do you think they just, like, you know, shook an onion in front of his face? I don't know. Some actors can do that. <laughs> like, pull those out of nowhere. No, but, I mean, his eyes look so red. Yeah, they probably irritated them with something. Like, onion, I am swear. I swear, they just cut a, a two onion. They cut it over an onion and a half, put a chaff in front of an eye. <laughs> just, like, <laughs> chopped it in front of them. Like, all right, well, that's how, yeah. good to know how you would do it. <laughs> you know, that's how I would do it. <laughs> but, um, Does uh, you have I don't to actually sign have a, that information. sign a waiver? A release? Well, I mean, you probably explain it to them and be like, are you okay with those? Yeah, get some, get, well, you gotta get that in written consent, man. You can't. But I mean, like, far worse has been done. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. Uh, I mean, like, remember when we talked about the uh, Sergio Leone movies? Yeah, I, well, that I was just thinking that's immediately where my mind went to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> I feel like there's no chance of actually like hurting somebody with it. Right? Yeah. No. Well. But anyway, so what do you think? Do you think this was shot on film, or do you think it was digital? Digital. And you're right. Fuck yeah. Yeah, it would have been kind of just Im- impractical, I feel like. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, also, especially, you know, given um, Jordan Peele this is his first time directing. Yeah, exactly. We, we didn't mention that earlier, but this is his, his first directorial... Directorial Yeah, debut. yeah, and we'll we'll talk about all his career and everything a little bit more next week. But, but yeah, so this was uh, a digital process, but was it anamorphic or spherical i don't think it was anamorphic no it was not okay it had the uh cinemascope ratio but it was not actually anamorphic okay so wait so it had the cinemascope ratio but it wasn't anamorphic yes so it had a big ass ratio well it was yeah basically it was crop top and bottom yeah, right 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 okay yeah, yeah. to make it wide it was right. quite wide yes uh which, according to uh, cinematographer Toby Oliver, was just because um, he thinks that uh, that's just more cinematic and that uh, the taller ratios look too much like TV to him. That's fair. I kind of agree with that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's one way of looking at it. Uh, so, But he has some interesting uh, things to say in this interview, which I read oh, yeah. uh, in Cinelix was the publication okay cinelinks sorry cinelinks cinelinks is the publication is the publication uh he was interviewed about uh several things and he was so this he was saying about the budget that he was actually really comfortable shooting with a um a four and a half million dollar budget because he is australian okay and apparently four and a half million around five million dollars is like the average budget for an australian movie <laughs> Perfect that. 
so um, he didn't have uh, any trouble doing that. Perfect guy to hire. Yeah, he also was saying how it was interesting that they they shot this movie entirely with zoom lenses. Interesting. Interesting. Um, which was not something he was used to, but apparently this was something that was done specifically because of Jordan Peele's sort of inexperience, as it were. What do you mean? So what is it? Basically, uh, he was saying, uh, in prep, I took Jordan into a rental house to have a look at some lenses on camera and get an idea of what he might like to use. Being a first-time director, his experience with gear and technicalities of filmmaking was limited. I demonstrated some cool vintage prime lenses and the classic Cook S4s, along with the ingenue zooms. As soon as Jordan saw the zooms, he said these were what he felt more comfortable with, and I was happy with that if it was easier for him to get his head around. While I had not shot a feature entirely on zooms before, I liked the look of the ingenues. I think they are very cinematic with a certain amount of warmth and character. So why do you think he felt more comfortable with the zooms? Or what makes them more... Well, because, you know, I think, you know... This is kind of... uh, Every time I've sort of... uh, shown somebody like you know my old cameras or whatever they're like or i'm like hey do you want to take a picture of me Uh, or like can you take a picture of me or whatever right so i pan them my film camera they always ask okay how do i zoom oh right people like to be able to without fail everybody always asks me people like to be able to zoom well because see yeah people like to be able to frame without it's it's a lot more complicated to change your framing Without a zoom lens? Yeah, well, if you have a... Like, you either need to change the lens or you need to move. Yeah, you need to readjust the whole shot. So I guess with a zoom lens, you can just, like... You can just turn the knob and it zooms in. So, yeah, I think it's just because, like, you know, now in this, you know, modern age, like, everybody's got, you know, zoom on their phone, right? Yeah, although I don't really ever use a zoom on my phone. I'm terrible at using it. Well, that's because the zoom on the phone is not an actual optical zoom, as we know. It's terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, that's not. Uh, what we're talking about. Uh, but anyway, yeah. No, I I just thought that that was uh, interesting. That uh, you know. That is interesting with Zoom because the whole thing is uh, so it's easier. I just like that that point about. Yeah, but like, there's not actually even that many zoom sh- like shots where the lens zooms in the movie. No, I mean there's a few, but it's just they use zoom lenses because that's what he was comfortable with. So okay, uh, let's talk about the sunken place. Okay. Which is the place he goes to in the film when he gets hypnotized and where he's going to go when he gets, you know, taken over. The most surreal shot in the film. Uh, let's talk about how uh, how uh, Toby Oliver explains it. Okay, how does he explain it? Because it's not really what I thought, although it makes sense. Yeah, so he says, uh, The sunken place is realized very close to the original concept ideas. While Jordan didn't want the character to actually look like he is underwater per se, I had the idea to use the technique of shooting dry for wet. Normally used to simulate deep underwater on a dry stage used in movies like The Abyss. Sick. We shot the an- the actor hanging on a wire. Um, on Did he sorry. work on The Abyss? No, he didn't. Okay. Uh, We shot the actor hanging on a wire rig in slow motion, in our case at 200 FPS, and had fans blowing to ripple his clothes. Then had the camera dolly uh, past him to suggest the idea of falling. The wire rig was fairly static, so I had the camera move around the actor to create movement. The drifting particles and the glowing screen were cleverly added in post-visual effects. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. So, I don't know. When I saw that, I assumed that it was all some sort of, like, weird VFX shot, but it seems like a lot of it was just, like, them on, I guess, a black background, like, uh, moving yeah, cameras just, around just, and blowing shit on him. They just dangled him. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it was It's actually pretty funny um, because, so what uh, uh, Jordan Peele said about it, we have him hang from a wire. Uh, it's very Cirque du Soleil. Um, we did the scene for a whole day, and it was very physically draining for Daniel. 
We did we did very physical physically exhaust shoots on Key and Peele, so I felt a nice advantage with the actors uh, when they had to do something uncomfortable or boring. Just knowing where people's mental states are, it was good for me to have been in s- been in a similar rig before and know how uncomfortable it is. <laughs> right? Is there a particular sketch that he did that? <laughs> Um, I, I looked for one, I couldn't find it, but we'll talk about it more. We're going to talk about Keen Peel a bit next week, so I'll, I'll do a bit more research and and, and try to find that sketch where he's dangling. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so he's, he's dangled before in slightly different context, apparently. Okay. So he knows, he knows not to leave his actors dangling for too long. And yeah, so one more thing, uh, that comes from this same interview is that, uh, Toby was asked, uh, Basically, if he approaches, uh, because there's such a comedy and dramatic, like, they're kind of both thrown in together in this movie, he was asked, like... Which we will crack open with a hammer and suck out the juices in the next episode. Yeah, so he was asked if he takes, if he, like, uh, if there's any different approach, you know, to filming the dramatic scenes versus the comedic scenes. And uh, basically his answer was, uh, not really. Uh, In the case of Get Out, we wanted the whole movie to feel cohesive and consistent, even when the mood changes from drama to thriller to horror to comedy. So it was approached similarly. If I was shooting a straight-up comedy, though, I would approach it differently to a horror. (laughs) Yeah, that was a weird question, almost. Why would you say that? Well, I just mean, like, of course they didn't, like... I mean, maybe not. Well, no, you might like you know. I guess it depends on when the question was asked. I mean, there's I was, the, there's I was, the, like, I was the classic. Uh, I I can't remember who said this, but somebody once said something like, you know, like tragedy is a close up and comedy is a wide shot. I have heard that. Yeah, we've talked, we've brought that up before, I think, but I can't remember who said that. But there definitely is a different approach. Is what yeah, I'm yeah. I was just, I more meant like, uh, I was. The context I was imagining was the person asking the question had already seen the film, but that might not necessarily be true. So you know, that's that's uh, hopefully that explains how how they um, how they put together what you see on screen. But what about what you hear? What about what you hear? How do they do the music? Well, the soundtrack was very important deal from the beginning, I think, and that is kind of evident um, by the by the fact that. This movie got like a huge soundtrack release, um, including a, a vinyl with a, a green marble LP, uh, which uh, I believe you told me that you know decreases the sound quality when you when you do it like that. But uh, actually, did I say that? Might not have been you. I feel like somebody told me that. Because that's actually not true. Oh, interesting. In fact, it's probably the well, opposite. Well, because I was just going to because they, they die it, don't they? Yes. So It's actually more raw. Okay, let me let, me let you in on... Well, yes, because chances are uh, black vinyl is made from some proportion... I don't, I don't know if this is the case anymore, but this used to definitely be the case, that uh, black vinyl is made uh, with a lot of recycled vinyl in it. Yeah, a lot of melted down records. Yes. So I don't know if that is still the case because I don't know. I don't think that many people are recycling vinyl anymore. But um, so as a result, uh, basically the strands, like the polymers on the record, they break down eventually. And, and you end up with um, a record that has more surface noise on it. Gotcha. Yeah. However, so you can't recycle the- re- vinyl that isn't black. Right, because the colors so green marbles all... fresh exactly. So any colored vinyl is going to be fresh vinyl. It won't be recycled, right. and it's un untreated, undyed, and un... well, it's dyed. But I mean, so is black vinyl. Look, what right. color do you think okay. vinyl is? Well, I don't fucking know. It's clear. So clear vinyl should be the best sound quality. The best audio quality. The yeah, best audio right. quality should about... be clear vinyl. I forgot about clear vinyl, so of course there's a yeah, it's clear. Yes, but yeah. So the point is of all this is that it w- it ga- it got this huge release, and he wrote this essay that had like basically went into more tons more detail about the f- the s- the audio or the soundtrack's connection to the film and its importance to the movie. Right. Um. I I tried to find the essay, couldn't find it. Uh. Didn't want to go too deep. 
digging because it would probably be an illegal way to find it, and I can't afford the LP, so there you go. If you want to know what he says, go buy the LP. Um, <laughs> it, what if you buy it? Do you have to buy the LP to get the, the thing, or...? Uh, uh, I don't actually know. I didn't look up if they get, if they give you the liner notes a, a digital download or a a, yeah. a a CD or whatever. I would assume yeah. not. It's a special right. to the vinyl, but I don't know. Yeah, I guess. I guess that's why you buy the vinyl. Yeah, exactly. That and all the extra shit. <laughs> um. So, uh, um, about the soundtrack, he said this is from Splinter News. Um. Peel worked with a c- with composer Michael Abels to create a score that was distinctly black, but that was sonically and lyrically different from African American music. Tends to have a quote, a glimmer of hope to it. Um, he goes on to say, "quote I was into this idea of distinct." Wait, he's saying that African American music has a glimmer of hope. Yeah, to his it? point was that he wanted okay. t- he wanted it to be totally black, but he didn't want it to have any hope. But his his concern was that most African American mu- or most African music, um, either both have like uh, glimmers of hope, and that was not what he wanted. <laughs> right. So he says, quote, I was at this idea of a distinct of distinctly black voices and black musical references. So it's got some African influences and some bluesy things going on, but in a scary way, um, which you never really hear. Um, I wanted Michael Abels, who did the score, to create something that felt like it lived in this absence of hope, but still had black roots. And I said to him, you have to avoid voodoo sounds, too. So he had a very uh, he was very. A very he wanted a very specific thing. Yeah, he thing. knew what he wanted, uh, and I think he got it. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. I do mean, do you have the the opening track for? I, ha- I do, I do. Um, I was about to say like I don't know if he completely avoided like voodoo motifs, but I mean I guess it's like yeah, play. It. What exactly makes something? Voodoo yeah. Mean? So that's that's the main track for the soundtrack, which is called Sikilisa Kawahenga. Um, oh, wow, you nailed that. Thank you. <laughs> 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 never, that's never happened before. Which, so that's a Swahili phrase, which translates to listen to your ancestors or listen to the ancestors. Um, and according to Jordan Peele, uh, in an interview that he gave with GQ... Uh, the rest of the lyrics of the song are, so they go brother, brother uh, in English, and then in something to the effect of uh, watch your back, something's coming, and it ain't good. Um, and that's what that was a quote from, from Peel. Watch your uh, back, well, something's coming, and it ain't good. pretty much describes the whole movie. Exactly. Um, and someone else grabbed it as like, uh, there's something coming, uh, run. Mm. Right, yeah, yeah. So. Get out. Yeah. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that. Yeah. So there's definitely some. There's the bluesy stuff and the the the. Uh, I don't know about the voodoo stuff. I don't really know what what counts. Yeah, as like exactly. What I don't know what exactly makes voodoo music. Voodoo music. Voodoo music. <laughs> so I don't know. But like, but I mean, I would definitely say like you know there might be like some Caribbean influences, right? Is all I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, but it's like. It's quite an original sounding soundtrack. Yeah, no, though. it definitely doesn't sound like uh what? Actually, 
what was I gonna say? Yeah, no, it definitely doesn't sound like uh, a lot of. Doesn't sound like any other horror movie necessarily. And it's totally it's reminiscent of things, but yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's it is singular. But yeah, like you said, it also very uh, not the most horror of soundtrack. Well, I mean, I'm not saying like it's not a good horror soundtrack, but one thing is it's it's oh, different no, no, yeah, yeah. from what you would expect. Not necessarily a conventional uh, exactly. uh, way to go exactly. about that. Yeah. 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 Um, so finally on the music, uh, they had the uh, the Childish Gambino song Red Bone in there. It's a good song. I like that song. Um, and that's apparently a, a, a relatively... Uh, that was chosen specifically. Oh, yeah, I know this um, one. Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to remind myself what it was. So Peel said, quote, Well, first of all... Oh, this is from Hip Hop DX, by the way. He said, quote, Well, first of all, I love the way... I love the Stay Woke lyric. That's what this movie is about. I wanted to make sure that this movie satisfied the black horror movie audience's need for characters to be smart and do things that intelligent, observant people would do. So I thought that was an interesting intelligent, connection. Intelligent, observant people them. like Rod the TSA agent? Like Rod the TSA <laughs> agent. Intelligent, observant people. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, so apparently he like uh, he was a huge fan of... of uh, uh, Donald Glover. Right. So he like invited him over and was like super nervous and he was like, Okay, uh I'm gonna play I'm gonna pl-. he so and he like played him the song over the movie and was like, Huh? Yeah. Huh? <laughs> so he'd already and, uh, done the edit, I guess. Just didn't I think yeah. he did, yeah. Okay, or yeah. <laughs> and he was like and uh, apparently yeah, Donald Glover was really flattered and was like, Of course, yeah. 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 That's great. Yeah, I mean I I would I think that's funny that that uh, the way he put that about being like you know kind of uh, nervous about that uh, when I was I'm thinking like now now Jordan Peele after having like won an Oscar and everything is like man now you're you're the yeah. one with clout now <laughs> like exactly exactly he should be nervous about working with you exactly yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, and we will talk about all of that next week yes so now uh yes. Um, actually, before we do this, <laughs> do you want to talk a little bit about uh, the thing I sent you about the TSA agents? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> this is just a funny tidbit that I found while I was looking into this movie, and I didn't really fit anything anywhere else. But um, basically, uh, I was trying to figure out, like, you know, had um, if, like, any TSA agents, like, how they would have reacted to this movie, because it's like rarely ever do you see like a tsa agent being the hero here <laughs> yeah exactly it's usually they're usually they're portrayed in a less they're than like an annoyance light. or something for the hero or something right exactly yeah they're they're yeah, wait so okay well, just uh what does the tsa stand for again the Transit transport Secur- security administration um yeah so it's like right. you know uh so I thought it was funny that uh, NPR had this segment where they interviewed a bunch of TSA agents about like what you thought, what they thought about this movie, right? Yeah, they loved it. And yeah, like um, they, uh, one woman would sorry, let me just get the quote she said here, but uh, basically uh, they were just saying like, oh, you know, how rare is it that uh, you know we get like a shout out in media because like you know all these. Um, all these uh, portrayals of us are we're the villain you know we're the villain and you know it really doesn't it really doesn't help us you know when uh it re- when we're just well, trying, we're trying to, to take with... our job seriously and yeah you no, know. no but also like you know um i it, i think it uh when somebody's basically uh annoyed uh patrons basically uh being rude to them and it it doesn't help that we're always portrayed that way <laughs> Right, yeah, like people's preconceptions. Yeah, of people them have all like... these preconceptions about us at the TSA, and that uh, you know, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. And there was another uh, thing where uh, Lil Rel, uh, what's the the actor's name? Lil Rel Howery. Oh yeah. Uh, he was asked about um, about the TSA agents in an interview with the New York Times and uh, they asked him uh, are you expecting special a- uh, special treatment from the TSA agents now and he says i can't wait to fly i don't have anywhere <laughs> to go but i might go somewhere for no reason next week just to see the reaction i get from TSA agents that's hilarious well i think it was um 
It was a, a Jordan Peele who was saying that it, he made him a TSA agent for the reason that it, he thought it was interesting because it's like it's like the one like situation that he's in regularly where he like the black man is not the most suspected like the not the most not assumed oh, to be I the see. most suspicious man in the room yeah because i was wondering why he made him a tsa agent because it's a really odd choice yeah and i think that's it it's like the one place where like people are racist more to other people <laughs> in right. america i guess i guess uh, it's just like yeah that's dark but it's true right yeah um a- anyway i i think the whole choice of making him a tsa agent uh was really funny and I, yeah and I it liked, worked out I really well that for... tidbit of all the tsa like these clearly annoyed people who who are annoyed about how they're portrayed in media and everything like i like how they in- enjoyed this portrayal they seem to really like it yeah yeah <laughs> and that one guy was like yeah people are already quoting the movie at me He's yeah like, i know and they're like, what are they quoting? He's like, oh, I can't say it on the air. And then they played the clip from the movie where he goes, T.S. motherfucking A. We handle we shit. We handle shit. It's what we do. <laughs> so I guess people are going up to him and saying that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. You know, I haven't been in an airport for a while, but next time I am, you know? <laughs> I feel like the, the glow from this movie has worn off, so they might not. I don't know if they'll. Yeah, I don't think a T.S. agent would react you know well to me swearing at them although maybe it's like a thing amongst tsa agents maybe they're all like super like into this movie yeah character. i don't know maybe next time i'm in the states i'll be like you know hey uh ts motherfucking hey am i right am i right am i right am i right, am I right? <laughs> you know? yeah yeah maybe you'll get beat up maybe you won't we'll see. <laughs> yeah i don't know <laughs> um i feel like so they'd probably just like you know kind of chuckle and be like move okay the fuck along, yeah. move along <laughs> you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so that will bring us now to our final segment of the evening, of the afternoon, or the morning, or whenever you have Whenever you're listening, listening to this. Yeah, because it's timeless, evergreen, these episodes are. Let's just go right to it. Yeah, fucking power through. <laughs> So, welcome to the segment known as Six Degrees of Star Trek, where we find out the connections between this film and Star Trek. Fuck uh, yes. This can be any screen appearance on Star Trek. It could be a TV show, it could be a movie, but it cannot be a comic book or video game. Okay. Um, okay. So... Uh, first, let's start with, uh, okay, wait, wait, before I continue, actually, uh, do you think this was difficult or easy? Do you think there are a lot of first connections, or do you think I have to go through a couple? It could go, it could go, it could go both ways. The only way it's easy is if there's a lot of connections to, like, Star Trek Discovery or something, but I don't know, Jordan Peele, he worked on TV a lot. He worked in comedy. I don't. I mean, I don't know. Maybe there's some connections there. So yeah. I'm gonna shoot in the dark, and I'm gonna say there was a lot of connections. Okay, there were. There are three direct connections. Oh fuck! Okay. Actually, it could be more, but I stopped at three. Okay. Um, I was kind of hoping that. Uh, uh, I don't actually know if Jordan Peele is a Star Trek fan, but he he, he seems like he might be. He's um, a horror fan. Yeah, I know. But uh, anyway, he's he, he's not he's not been in Star Trek. Oh, okay, bummer. But uh, you know who has a bunch <laughs> of people in this movie. Really? All right, starting with Marcus Henderson, who plays Walt in this movie. <laughs> okay, who does he play in Star Trek? Uh, so he's been in uh, four episodes of Star Trek Lower Decks, which is okay. the recent animated uh, Star Trek. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Uh, which I have mixed feelings on. 
Uh, yeah, we've we've discussed it. It's come up a couple of times, actually. Yeah, where he plays a uh, Lieutenant Jet, or voices Lieutenant Jet. Voices, yeah, yeah. So who uh, is Lieutenant Jet? Is that a good character? You know, um, I don't know if I've even seen these episodes because these came out recently. Oh, okay. Well, um, shit, I'm behind on my Star Trek. I gotta finish her off. You haven't seen all the Star Trek available? Well, they keep making it. <laughs> well, you gotta keep watching it. I know, so I gotta I gotta get back on this. Uh, but yeah, Lieutenant <laughs> Jet. So the next connection is Stephen Root. Oh right, Stephen Root. I've totally forgot because he, yeah, he, he he's been in before. It. Yeah, he's been in two episodes of Star Trek: The Next Generation as Captain Kavada, who Captain is a Klingon. Kavada. A Klingon. We talked about him with, I assume, on uh, on the Office, Office Space, Space episode. Yeah, we did. But yeah, he uh, he's in the uh, two-parter Unification Part 1 and 2 of Star Trek The Next Generation, which is uh, the one with... Uh, is that the one with Spock? Star Trek 2? Uh, no, that's that's the uh, that's the one with uh, Spock's dad. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's a... Um, yeah, yeah. Two episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation as Captain Gavada, who is a Klingon. So, we continue. Down the list we go. Down the list we go. We get to Richard Hurd. And who does Richard Hurd or Hard? Hurd. Who does who Richard Hurd Roman play? Armitage. Oh, the father. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. The grandfather, I mean. Yeah. He's on the TV. Yeah, that, but that actor was very familiar. I couldn't place him, but it doesn't surprise you me. You probably didn't. know him from Star Trek Voyager. <laughs> <laughs> Is he Neelix? No. No. Who does he play? I'm he sorry, I, I'm totally blanking on his Admiral face. Admiral Paris. Oh, he plays right. Tom Paris's dad. He's Tom Paris's dad. That's so good. Oh, that's uh, fantastic. And he has been in, I believe, four episodes of Voyager. Yeah. His dad's a real piece of shit, isn't he? I mean, or no? I'm, sorry, I'm thinking of, of I'm thinking of a Riker's dad. Oh no, Riker's dad is a real piece of shit. But yeah, but I mean, uh, obviously him and his dad, like uh, Paris and his dad, have some beef. Oh really? Sure. Paris has daddy issues. I'm shocked. Oh, obviously he does. He's fucking Paris. Yeah, Tom <laughs> Paris is the like biggest daddy complex I've ever seen. In Star yeah. Trek, besides Kirk. What? Do we Kirk ever really has, talk about Kirk's dad? Kirk's daddy has the biggest has the or Kirk has the biggest daddy issues of them all. What do you mean? Don't, just look at him. When, look at when the way do we he talk acts. about Kirk's dad? What? When do we talk about Kirk's dad? We haven't talked about Kirk's dad. No. When do they in Star Trek? But let's not get into it. <laughs> what do you mean? Just look at him. I don't know what you're talking about. He's acting out. What? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Let's sorry, move on. I don't I don't buy it. <laughs> He's got daddy issues, Kirk. Right. Anyway, so those <laughs> were three direct Star Trek connections. Hope you enjoyed Fuck them. Yeah. They were good. They were good ones. I did enjoy them. T S motherfucking A. Get shit done. We handle shit. Oh, yeah, we handle shit. I keep fucking with that. He still thinks it's the sex lives at that point, eh? Oh, yeah, it's true. They, never in the movie does he actually figure out what's actually going on. It's true. He never he learns He just knows that there's some shit going on. And he's, So he sees him covered in blood. He assumes sex slaves. <laughs> yeah, as far as he knows, it's weird fucking sex slave shit. That, that's probably menstrual blood. Oh, God. <laughs> Well, I mean, now you know what to prepare for in the Love Witch. <laughs> oh, good. That's good news. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so there you go. That's this week's episode. Yeah. Uh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Bit bit bit. Uh, I have shout-outs to do. Shout-outs, shout-outs, shout-outs. Uh, I want to thank all our Italian listeners for tuning in. Mamma mia. Okay, it's not. 
<laughs> I'm surprised they tune in because I'm consistently uh, making fun of the way they talk. Yeah, somehow despite your, uh, you know, offensive behavior, they, uh, <laughs> they keep coming back. Um, well, I appreciate them, so thank you. How do you say thank yeah. you in uh, Italian? Grazie. You've asked grazie. me this before. Of course, yeah, grazie. There we go. <laughs> um, yeah, all right. Uh, see you guys next week for part two. Same movie. Same movie. Around the same time. Round two. And we're not on a channel, so. (laughs) Tune in. Tune in. Same bat time, same bat channel. All right, uh, all right. Peace out.